You're listening to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Show, a podcast to inspire physicians in the process of immigration to the United States and access to graduate medical education. We create meaningful and helpful content that motivates medical students and doctors throughout the world with the goal of creating a community that supports itself and gives feedback to each other, that stays updated with the most recent tips and advice on how to make it in America and become a successful resident or fellow in the speciality of your dreams. Dr. Alonso Osorio is board certified and residency trained in both emergency and family medicine and will be bringing you 20 years of his personal experiences, struggles and motivation. We'll be chatting with people like you to talk about the lessons they've learned along their personal path, how to make an impact and how we can all benefit from it. Also, we'll analyze the current resources available and how to benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to episode number 22 of the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Podcast. I am extremely excited to have Dr. Giselle Melendez. Dr. Melendez and I go back literally 20 years ago when we initially met at uh, the University of Miami at the Jackson uh, Memorial Hospital doing our observerships at the uh, William J. Harrington Medical Training Programs for Latin America. And she decided to take uh, an hour or so from her extremely busy schedule and her family to be here with us today to speak about her very specific path. And one of the real reasons why I brought her over is because in the online forums and specifically I've been seeing people reaching out to me asking me about what to do to strengthen their CV and they're asking me specifically about research. I would say I don't know much about research. I didn't do anything about it. So my job is to bring the experts because Dr. Melendez is not only a medical doctor, but she also has completely based her very busy career on doing a very specialized research. And she's currently residing in uh, uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, working for Wake Forest University a School of Medicine. So Dr. Melendez, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna introduce you really briefly because your uh, resume is rather impressive. So just thank you for being here. and. Uh, uh, I'm super excited to have you over because I know that many people that have a lot of questions on, on how to become a doctor in the United States uh, are, are looking to have some information from you. Thank you, Alonso. It's my pleasure to be here and discussing uh, this unorthodox uh, path for me. <laughs> yes, so Dr. Melendez, uh, it's a natural, uh, originally from Venezuela, and she uh, went to university Centro Occidental Lisandro Alvarado in Barquisimeto, Venezuela. She graduated from uh, as a medical doctor in 2003, and currently, as I said, she's doing extensive research at Wake Forest University. Uh, Dr. Melendez uh, has been uh, in the U.S. since 2006, and she obviously came here to pursue a career in science. She has completed so far a postdoctoral fellowship in cell biology and anatomy from the University of South Carolina. She's focusing mainly on research on heart failure and extracellular remodeling, and completed an additional postdoctoral training in preclinical models of cardiovascular disease in non-human primates with the Department of Pathology at Wake Forest School of Medicine. And in 2015, she joined Wake Forest School of Medicine's Department of Cardiology to conduct basic and population cardiovascular research. Well, as you can see, guys, she's extremely specialized. So, Dr. Uh, Melendez, can you tell us more about yourself and about what you exactly spend your, your, your days uh, doing at the lab and in your office? Sure, sure. Um, as you very well uh, pointed out, I'm a physician scientist. I um, joined Wake Forest, Wake Forest in 2012. Um, I became an assistant professor in the Department of Cardiology uh, in 2016 with a dual appointment uh, with the Department of Pathology section on comparative medicine. And I um, specialize in translational medicine. Specifically, I uh, work in a new area, in a, in a very new specialty called 
cardio-oncology. So what uh, I specifically do is I conduct research trying to better understand what are the underlying causes of cardiovascular toxicities induced by cancer therapies. Many people tend to think that cardio-oncologies uh, cardio are tumors uh, of the heart, but it's really the toxic effects of uh, life-saving therapies. And that is what I do in a nutshell. I do conduct basic science studies. I work with non-human primates, and I also participate in clinical trials and conduct population studies. And uh, for those purposes, I specialize um, in cardiovascular MRI, and I use imaging techniques for the population studies. I'm remarkable, humbled by that. I wish we had more people like you. So where this passion came from uh, for research and, and to become a scientist on this way? You know, I'm so glad that you brought um, up the word passion because uh, passion is not a word that you frequently use in the same sense as a science. But, you know, I I think uh, in my experience, uh, the most successful scientists, researchers, and innovators, they are 99% of the time really motivated by this passion. I, I think, you know, this is something that comes uh, from my childhood in that regard. I think I still have my five-year-old self inside me, you know, with an insatiable curiosity to understand the whys. And when I went to medical school, I was always intrigued and it, it really blew my mind away when you're reading Harrison and you see all these little references and you go back to the last page just a of the book and yeah. you see the citations of all all the studies and and back in Venezuela we didn't have uh, much access to the internet and I didn't know what PubMed was uh, mm -hmm. right and you know I always found myself asking why why how the how did we come up with ACE inhibitors how were they tested how did we figure out that they work and so that was always uh, a good question, uh, that questions that came up during my career path. Also, as, as you may know, from a family perspective, I'm the daughter of, of two physicians. My, both my parents are internists. Very, uh, very charming parents. I actually had the pleasure <laughs> to meet them both. Very Thank sweet you. people. Thank you. And I think specifically my dad has, uh, it's very driven by science and uh, he imprinted uh, that curiosity in me. And at a personal level, my younger brother, my late younger brother, um, was born with a very complex disease called allergy syndrome. Very rare, it occurs in one in a hundred thousand life born and well, you know, the, he passed away uh, this year. It's going to be 20 years from, uh, wow. from the time that he passed away. But he underwent a, a liver transplant because he had an atresia of the bile ducts. And, you know, when he passed away due to a chronic rejection of the organ, the first thing that came to my mind and, you know, being at Jackson Memorial, taking care of him uh, with my family and, and a, a remarkable team of doctors, the first thing that came to my mind was not how medicine failed us, but it was quite a country. It's the fact that we were lucky to have him for 15 years, and that was because of the advances in science. If he would have been born 20 years before that time, perhaps he wouldn't have survived the first three years of life. And so that in itself, it's it's something that um, you know struck me as a good as as a, as a positive thing of science. And oh, I would and say I would say taking a, a taking a, a family strategy like this, losing your only brother uh, that was in with, with us for many years, and it's the only way that you had to give back. I would say that you're giving back by putting in the hours to whatever doctors back in the day did for your brother. Correct. That is exactly right. That is exactly, exactly right. And science has been part of my life and my personal life has been enriched by the advances of medicine and the advances of science for sure. Dr. Melendez, uh, I know it's been 20 years in the making to make it to this position that you're in this highly renowned university. By the way, guys, to our listeners, she works in 
one one of the very few, only five, tell me if I'm wrong, of the uh, non-human primates uh, research labs or what we call monkey labs in the United States. So she has access to these specific uh, animals to do her, her research. And, and tell us how, how a center gets to be privileged to be able to do these complex studies that I bet sometimes are ethically difficult to, to, to do. That's, that's correct. Politically speaking, we are no longer a primate center. That's a very specific designation, but, uh, you know, we call it our primate, primate center. It's partially funded by the National Institute of Health, the NIH, and it's also funded by the institution. This is a very unique resource that we have here at Wake Forest University, and we are very proud of it. We have um, colonies of monkeys, and they serve as a link in between mirroring models, so small animals, rats and mice, and humans. And so, needless to say, we count with a uh, remarkable, specialized and talented group of faculty that conduct studies in these in this, um, animals. And they definitely are relevant questions that cannot be answered either in a human or a uh, or small animal, so they are critical studies for sure. Yeah, this is awesome. Tell us about how do you get here? I know that when we met, uh, you didn't know if you wanted to potentially do clinical medicine uh, since you were so focused on research from the very beginning. Tell us what was the path over these twenty years that you have taken across the United States with your husband and now with your beautiful three-year-old daughter. By the way, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> We're actually guys, personal friends. We've known each other for a very, very, very long time. Her husband <laughs> is a, a surgeon, and he works in the same state as, as Giselle. So if, by having said that, go ahead. Yes. So <clears throat> when I moved to the United States um, in 2006, I already had some experience here in at Jackson Memorial. And, uh, of course, through you know, my brother, because my brother was uh, mainly treated at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And so when I was with him um, at the hospital, I used to see these Latin American students rotating through the wards and and uh, doing rounds on, on my younger brother. And, and sometimes, you know, I saw them speak in Spanish among them. And I asked them, you know, where are you from? Where, what are you doing? At the moment, I was just in high school. And so they explained that there was this program called the Harrington program. And years later, when, and, and, and then, you know, back then I thought, woo, how cool, you know, I, I want to have that same experience. And so when uh, the time came for me that I was already in third or fourth uh, year of medical school, I decided to apply to the program for two reasons. Um, the main reason is I knew I wanted to to be involved in medical research, in biomedical research. I knew that uh, from a very early, early stages in my career, and I, in fact, I did a lot of research at the IBIC, the Venezuelan Institute of, of Research, it, during my summers, during my vacation time from medical school. Wow. And so, but I wanted to know whether rotating in the States would provide me with an extra or a different perspective of how medical, I, I sort of knew from a per patient perspective, but I wanted to better understand if this was going to be a good fit for me. And so I applied to the Harrington program. I was accepted. And because my university didn't have the sort of the exchange program that you guys had in Colombia with mm -hmm. uh, the Universidad uh, Industrial de Santander, for example, I was just able to rotate through the summers. So I did that during two or three summers, if I recall this well, during the last three years. So, so, so you were doing this during the gaps that you had in medical school. You that, were not really authorized by the university to come over. You just said, on my time off, I'm going to get it done. That's correct. That wow. is correct. That's a sacrifice. 
And so I did that. And so inevitably during these rotations, I was sneaking out of some rotations to be able to get involved with some laboratories. Okay. So the, one of the things that I did during that time was to rotate with Dr. Edith Siqueira. He was an amazing neurosurgeon uh, from Brazil that was practicing at the moment. He passed away a few years ago, but he was the first person that introduced me to research. And one of the things that I learned with him were basic science techniques that were going to be useful that just thanks to him, perhaps I got my first postdoctoral fellowship here in the States. And so during that time, I graduated uh, from medical school. I rotated and completed my rotation successfully. I came back to Venezuela, graduated from medical school, went back to do my rural year because that was mandatory, right? So I had to go uh, into a really small town in... Uh, Chivacoa, Chivacoa, Chivacoa. Chivacoa, that's right, that's Do right. Doctor, <laughs> hospital... Tiburcio Garrido. Tiburcio Garrido, that's exactly right. And I completed my my rural year there. Those were fun times. And as you may know, and many of your guests have described how fun it is to do that rural year, I enjoyed it very much. And so, and nonetheless, after completing that rural, rural year, I decided that I wanted to come back to the States and pursue my dream of becoming a physician scientist. And so... At the time, I didn't know where to start. What was the, the typical path of a person that wanted to do? Yes, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but actually yes. that's, a, that's a question that I get from everybody. Where do I start? Okay. And, and you're here to tell us the secret on how to get committed and follow that lead. Perhaps what I can start, what is the typical pathway okay and then i can tell you what i had to do and the barriers that i encounter how Perfect. about that Go for okay it. sounds good so in the united states a person that wants to pursue a decision scientist career typically they go through an undergraduate education first right so those are the college years then they went to they go on to a, a predoctoral training okay this can be either a phd or an md or there are programs that are combined as phds and md degrees right after you graduate from those those uh, programs you go on to the next the postgraduate training phds typically go on a postdoctoral training, which is the equivalent of a clinical residency, okay? Perfect. If you are an MD or a PhD, you have the option of moving on to a clinical residency with an interest in research or, that, or a program that are called physician, there are formal physician, per, physician scientist programs, okay? And those are very highly specialized long programs. They typically are four to six years long, okay? And they have a mixture of clinical exposure and basic science or epidemiological population science research. And that's pretty much the typical training. When I came to the United States only with an MD degree, I faced two issues. One, I had to take the USMLEs, correct? Correct. And two, I did not qualify for any of the physician scientist programs at the moment. We're talking about, you know, 2007, 2000, yeah, between 2006 and 2008, because either I did not have an MD, PhD, and I was an IMG. So many of these highly specialized programs were not accepting IMGs or FMGs or anything. Why, why would that be? I do not know. I don't have an exact, a precise answer for that, but they're highly competitive. And do you think is the limitations on the, on the visa sponsorship, if that's the case? I would say yes, because these are very long programs. I was before on an H-1B visa, and that visa only goes for five years. These are programs that can go up to, you know, six or seven years, some of them, if it, depending on the path that you take. And they are simply highly competitive. And we are talking about Ivy League schools. We're talking about, you know, Yale. We're talking about Brigham. We are talking about... Uh, 
Duke, where, you know, these are Ivy League schools, and you more than anybody know, knows that uh, this is something that it's a great limiting step for us. And so my options at the moment were, you know, well, <laughs> I had two very distinct career paths. I either pursue a clinical path and uh, forget about research because going through residency and fellowship is not, it's, it doesn't give you any time to do research, right? Obviously, and, I yeah, knew deep in, and I knew deep in my heart that once I would, you know, kind of jump on the clinical treadmill, it was going to be very hard to come off that treadmill. Yeah, if you follow that path, it's super hard to just go back to do what That's you're passionate right. about, yeah. The pa the patient's life uh, suck you into it and, and, and there is no going back, I agree. There is no going back, that's correct. And typically that path doesn't offer, uh, often doesn't offer protected time, right? To conduct yeah. research. Or the other option I had was to pursue a postdoctoral training. So that was a really difficult decision because I had no guidance on that regard. So at the moment, the only person that was able to give me some feedback and, and some pointers in how to do that was uh, Dr. Adir Sikera at the moment. And so he said, uh, well, Giselle, you need to beef up, that's the word that he used, beef up your CV. I see that you have some background in research, which, which is great and you need to start applying to postdoctoral fellowship positions so let me tell you how I did that um, I published my resume my CV I highlighted the few publications which you know looking back they were not really publications they they were not peered reviewed publications. They were little uh, research uh, jobs here and there. We published some abstracts, we presented some posters, but they do count. And I crafted my CV in a way that would highlight some of the things that I could do in a lab and the experiences that I had in a lab. So when I was doing these uh, research rotations in Venezuela, Caracas, uh, the National uh, Venezuelan Institute of Research, I learned how to handle animals, small animals that are very widely used for biomedical research. I learned how to run some basic science uh, studies like like ELISA's, Western blots, even a little bit of PCR. And even though I wasn't an expert, that's something that I highlighted there in my, in my CV. And I really had a person that I interview with that he, I really call him, he's my research father, he's Dr. Joseph Janiki, and, and he gave me my first postdoctoral position. Uh, I, re I, rem I remember you used to talk about him quite a bit. He, well, long story short, to add a, a layer of complexity to that situation, at the moment, my husband, Diego, matched in South Carolina. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yes. Match in a categorical position for surgery. And at the moment, I was like, ooh, what do I do? And uh, Yeah, it's, it, it's either his career or your career. Or, your, or my career, right. And so I remember that we were in that decision making of, well, you know, do we get married? Don't we get married? What, what you know, what, what do we do? And I said, well, listen, if I get the job, I'll get married. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but when I interview with Joe Janiki, he was in the process of moving from Alabama precisely. And this, I mean, all the stars align and he was moving to South Carolina wow. uh, on the what same university. Uh, yes. At the same university where, where Diego, my husband, matched. And, you know, I applied to many other positions and I was called to other interviews. And at the moment, I decided, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the job. And he was a cardiovascular investigator, and that's what I wanted to do. And at the moment, the, you know, naive 24-year-old self that I was at the moment, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to take the steps, and I'm going to go back and match into a clinical residency and continue my research and clinical. So you're saying <laughs> that you said, 
let's give it a shot and do uh, participating in the National Residency Matching Program. Right. And I'll just go back and do research if I have time, right? Well, on the contrary, you know, what I wanted to do is was, uh, you know, be able to combine both things uh, at a time, at the same you know, time. at the same time. Um, and so I started my postdoctoral fellowship uh, with him. Uh, I remember this clearly. Um, and I remember my job interview with him. You know, I, I, I came to the job interview, you know, really well dressed, super nervous with, uh, I read all his publications wow. and, and he started asking me questions, uh, questions about my prior research. And I, you know, my fear was, what if I am not good enough for this? What if he sees through me that my research experience is not, is not very thorough. Um, I am not a PhD. Uh, I am an MD with a strong interest in, in research. But, you know, in the middle of the conversation, I even said, listen, if you think that this postdoctoral position might be not appropriate, I, I'm willing to do some other things uh, like a research uh, assistant or something along those lines that can, you know, get me up to speed in, in this trade. And he said, I remember clearly, like it was yesterday, and he said, no, no you're an MD, you're more than qualified to do this job. Wow. And so, and he offered me the job on the spot. Well, there was, when you said having a job, it meant that it was, it was already a paid job. By now, had, had you been already paid for what you were doing? Because I know many people said, oh, while well, you do research, just sacrifice yourself because you're going to sustain yourself and you might not make any money in the process okay. of doing research, correct? Correct. So this was going to be a paid job. So remember, this is the equivalent of a residency, clinical residency for an MD. Okay. okay. So it was a paid job. And with that, I, you know, I, I couldn't contain my, my excitement. And as the Latin American person that I am, I, I went and hugged him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think he still remembers that <laughs> to this day. And the next step and the next difficulty for me, it was the visa process because he was offering me a J-1 visa. Wow. Uh, yeah. We, so don't, we, don't, we, did, we don't like the Js, right? And especially like you, you used to have an H-1 before then, right? Well, no, before I had a student visa. Okay. All right. So remember that I was just coming to the States as a student and actually it wasn't even a student. I don't remember. We used these B1, B2 visas for the Harrison, Harrington program, you know, and I wasn't staying for long periods of time at the moment. But uh, one thing I will say that in research, negotiating the type of visa at the at least at the moment that uh, this happened for me we're talking about two, 2006 it's it has more flexibility okay um and the reason is because uh there's shortage of diversity in the research arena okay um, so it's not uncommon for institutions to provide H-1B visas. Oh, good to know. Yes, that's, that's a good point. I think that's still the so, case. So since there's not many of you that want to go into that path, there is a need. And when you have a need, there is a way to have the labor certification process that's right. by obtaining an H-1. That's great to know. Yes, yes, that's correct. But that was something that I had to negotiate. Um, and actually, you know, the university at the moment, uh, University of South Carolina said, this is an expensive process and we won't be able to afford it. But if you can pay for it, I uh, will be delighted to sponsor you. Um, and of course I said, yes, I, I, I you know, I reach give out me, to Mercedes and do it. <laughs> give, me, give me a gross idea of how much money you paid back in 2006. It was about $5,000. With an attorney, correct? With an attorney that it was provided by the university. So it was pretty much the, the filing forms. Um, the, the, attor the attorney was sponsored by the university, but, but the filing fees and the you know, background checks um, and all that jazz was paid by me. You, you had said earlier that um, 
you had uh, when you presented to Dr. Uh, Joseph Janicki, you felt that your CV was not as, as strong, that you thought that you had some publications that were, but they were not peer review. I'm looking at your resume here and you have more than 28, almost 30 peer review publications. That's a big deal. Can you tell us what's the difference in, in between just making a simple publication versus having a peer reviewed uh, publication? Yes. There's different levels of publications and there, there are different impact factor journals, okay? The higher the impact factor, the most scrutiny your research goes through. And, and the longer and the more effort it takes to get them published. There are many journals that are um, non-peer reviewed, which means that the editor makes the decision whether to publish or not. So those are publications that are not really well scrutinized. They do not go through a scientific rigor, okay? And um, they typically, in the scientific community, they're not well regarded. They, that, that's something that if a person wants to pursue a career in science, you need to be cognizant of this detail. Also, publishing very small things in, you know, for example, if you're going to publish a very small study in a very low impact journal, it may be good when you're starting up, but it's not good when you advance uh, later in your, your career. So, for example, right now I'm at the stage of transitioning from, from early career to a mid-career investigator uh, in the pathway to uh, becoming an established independent investigator. I'm expected to publish in in journals that have high impact. So, for example, to give you a notion, circulation research, I think the impact factor is around eight. Uh, the New, Jer New England Journal of Medicine, it's about 20, for example. So, you know, the, the higher the number, the uh, more impact it has. And, of course, it's the most scrutinized and difficult to publish in those, in those right. journals. Wow, that's so. The more you publish in a higher, well-recognized peer-reviewed journal, the more quote-unquote points you get. That potentially gives you more advancement in your career. Would you absolutely. say absolutely? And the more credibility gives you as well. And the higher the quality of your work, the higher the likelihood that you're going to get published in these higher impact journals. Doctor Melendez, I had a question here for you. Uh, what? And forgive my ignorance, but I'm just going to ask you, like, if I was a lay person, mm -hmm. why is research so important? Because I didn't see it happening that much in Latin America. Why is research so important for academic, highly renowned universities in the United States? And why do they want people like you to, to work for them? That's a great question. Um, uh, you know. <clears throat> is it the money factor? Is it the recognition factor? That's what I'm trying to kind of head. Towards. So it is the recognition factor, and it's also cutting edge, the access to cutting edge technology, state of the art technology to treat patients. For example, I think, you know, physician scientists really is an endangered species um, nowadays, and I think it's because of the struggles that we go through to obtain funding. And we can talk about funding a little bit later on. But, you know, if research doesn't advance, we really could lose the next generation of life-saving treatments, okay? So, for example, here at Wake Forest, we conduct clinical trials that are testing potentially saving life-saving uh, treatments. And if we don't do this, medical science and medical advances are going to get stuck. Specifically in what I do, I conduct studies in cardiovascular medicine, right? And, um, you know, the progress has been slow. We have many new technologies, but without the medical research, without the proper and you know, well-designed basic science, science studies that can be translated into clinical practice, 
medicine won't advance. That is the key of advancing medicine and, and developing new treatment strategies. And not only treatment, early prevention, early detection to prevent the progression of disease. And that's precisely what translational investigators like me try to accomplish. You said that you're a, 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 a species on extinction. Please stay home for COVID-19. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I want you to remain productive and <laughs> doing what you're doing. Oh, my God. So this, this has been fun. So how, when, when a, a young foreign medical guy tells me, hey, Dr. Osar, I would like to do some research, what, what should be my answer? Uh, how should I guide them? Uh, where should they start? Who who should they try to contact? Who should be the... I think you should start by asking the question, why do you want to do research? Okay. Do you want to do research as a springboard to do better in the match? Do you want to research because that's what puts a fire in your belly? Do you do research because you have this curiosity of knowing more. You want to know more. What is the motivation behind doing research? And depending on that answer, you can tailor the path. If you want to do research to strengthen your, make a, a stronger application to the match, you have to do that really well. Depend and that depends. Not all research will make your application better. Sometimes it can be seen as a distraction. I can tell you that now I'm I'm sort of on the other side and I review applications uh, from residents that are applying to cardiology fellowship and sometimes you know the degree of research that they have done may or may not be well tailored to what they're trying to pursue. If you are trying to use it as a springboard to get into a fellowship, I can tell you that you really have to articulate that very well, otherwise it's going to show. And the people reviewing these applications, they know all these sort of quote-unquote tricks, right? And, and still, um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that is a double-edged sword. So you really need to be careful in using research um, as a springboard. Make sure that the research that you're conducting, you're not being, quote unquote, exploited, right, for your time. Yes. You know? I, I know that that happens quite a bit. It, it does. Um, so with a shortage of uh, funds for research, many investigators trying to find what we call free labor. What is it that you're doing in a lab? Are you, you know, cleaning dishes? Are you counting cells? Um, are you going to be part of a recent pub, a, a research publication? I would say the latter is your aim. You okay. want to put your name in a publication. And that's a conversation that you have to have from the get-go with your principal investigator or the person that you're going to be working for. How can I make a significant contribution to the research that you're doing and can I be part of that publication okay and so that's something that you need to follow up because remember these scientific uh, research sometimes takes years and if you're gonna be rotating in a lot for two or three years you know it's you know is that going to be enough? Is that going to be a significant contribution to be part, be part of an authorship list in a research publication? Since you mentioned the, the authorship list, I know that at the very uh, beginning when, when people send you to the labs and you're looking for articles for any homework that they gave you at the university, you, they give you the, the, the citation at the end of the book that you need to look for. And I'm looking here, you're the number one scientist behind most of the articles that you have listed in your resume. To be number one, I know that it takes a lot of effort to be the number one because then you say you have like 20 people chasing you and then at all. 
That's right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes. How do you get so, included to be at least the last one in the title? Okay, so let me clarify that point. The first and last uh, authors on a publication are the most prominent authors in a publication. The first one and the last? The first one and the last. Wow. So many people doesn't, doesn't see that or doesn't understand that. But let me explain to you what the difference is. So if you are the first author in the publication, you are the person who is actively conducting the work. You are doing the analysis, you're reading the cardiac MRIs, you're conducting the experiments, you're contributing to the um, design of the study, right? Um, under the guidance of a senior mentor or a senior author who's going to be the last author, okay? Wow. So the last author is kind of the, the father of the research, okay? Um, um, <clears throat> the father, and you will see that I'm starting to get to that stage. Typically, those are mid-stage career investigators, which is something that I'm transitioning into now that I have my own independent funding. And we can talk more about Yes, funding. yes. Let, we'll talk about funding in a little bit. That is correct. So the, the senior author typically is the person that comes up with the idea that brings in the money to conduct the research and is the leader of the team. And that's the first sign that you are an independent investigator, okay? And while you're not doing the work hands-on, you are overseeing every single step of the way, okay? Including writing the manuscript and conducting all the statistical analysis if that's the, the appropriate um, uh, type of research that you're conducting. Um, so that is the senior author. So yes, it's good. So at my, my stage, I accomplished what I needed to do. So those are uh, phases that I need to have. So for me, for my next promotion, I need to complete a certain number of uh, first author papers to be able to get promoted into the next stage. Wow. That's a, that's a long path, Doc. Um, I know. So talking about funding, I know that uh, funding has been cutting down. And later on, on that article that you sent me uh, to, to prepare myself for, for this highly specialized interview, I noticed that uh, funding sometimes is fundamental and crucial also to, 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 to support yourself and to be able to produce stuff. Where, where the money funnels from? How do you handle the money? How do you disperse the money? How, how do you get the funding? I know the NIH plays a huge role in this. And can you make it in a very simple way so we understand how this huge complex system works in the United States? Of course. Um, so the um, top agency that provides funding for uh, biomedical research is the National Institutes of Health. The NIH. The NIH is subdivided in different sub-institutes. So for me that I conduct um, studies in cardiovascular research under the umbrella of the NHLBI's, National Heart, Lung and Circulation Institute, okay? So that is my, my institute. There's a series of grant systems. Perhaps this is an entire different po podcast, but... Sure, um, sure. We can do uh, that. When you're a postdoctoral fellow, you are under the umbrella of your PI. Your PI should have enough support from the NIH or any other equivalent source, okay? It's not just the NIH. There are many other um, federal and non-federal institutions. For example, in my case, it's the American Heart Association, just as an example, uh, that can also provide such funding. And you are under the umbrella of your PI, your principal investigator. The PI will provide your salary and uh, research dollars for, for the studies that need to be conducted. When you're a postdoctoral fellow, you are entitled to apply or you're eligible to apply to certain pre-doctoral or post-doctoral. If you're an undergrad, there are some pre-doctoral smaller grants that you can apply to. That's always a plus. When you're a postdoctoral fellow, you have the same benefits. 
when you are transitioning into a, a faculty position that that varies from institution to institution you can either start um, obtaining funding from small foundation grants intramural grants which are they typically are given by your institution you still have to compete for these pilot fundings these pilot fundings what they do for you is they help you to obtain critical preliminary data to compete for the big grants what are the big grants the big grants for an early career stage investigator, as I am right now, are K Awards and R Awards. The R series of awards are kind of the big grants. Think big bucks, right? That's okay. kind of the goal of any investigator. Um, and so... You know you know what makes me... You have done put so much sacrifice into it and you said, I'm in the meat, middle of my career. You know, and it's been so much. It's so hard to be accomplished on this on this path. It's a lot of hard work, Dr. Melendez. Congratulations on that. So, Thank so you. You, you were saying there is two types of award, the K and the R. The R is the big money, right? It's the big money. But the K, mm -hmm. it's a very special grant because it's something that is helping me transition from being a... Um, from being a trainee or a postdoctoral fellow into becoming an independent investigator, okay? That means you have your own lab, you're responsible for your decisions, you're responsible for how you spend your money and whether you're productive or not. Um, you are protected 100% just for research. Um, you know, there are other grants that you still have to do, you know, not, not all the grants protect you 100%. Right now, my salary is 100% covered by my grant. Um, and this is the time to shine. This is a time to really show that you are productive. Um, for me to obtain this grant, I had to, there were really, these were really hard years uh, where, where I was in my institution with not much institutional support, but I had to prove myself. I had to prove that I had what, I, what it was needed to become a successful investigator. And I think I, I still am under, kind of under the loop, under the microscope. And I was lucky enough to get funded in, you know, with little piles of, uh, Funding from foundations, philanthropy, um, you know, my chairman, uh, Dr. Dr. David Harrington, who's been an amazing, an amazing mentor I've had. Alonso, I have to say, I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for number one, Dr. Joe Janicki, uh, number two for Dr. Tom Clarkson, who also passed away a few years ago. And, and thanks to Dr. Harrington, who they have always believed in me and supported me all the way. And, um, you know, thanks to them, I was able to make the most out of these pilot fundings that I got and translate that into a successful K award. And I'm on currently on the first year of, of that K award and I'm part of other R01s um, in collaboration with other investigators. Can you tell me uh, about uh, this very recent nomination that you had at Wake Forest University with the uh, receiving the Dean's Hero Award uh, uh, as of uh, 2018? Yes, so we have um, the Dean's Hero Award. It's something um, that the Dean decides, um, you know, among all the faculty conducting research, um, she decides to give this award to a few investigators a year and that comes with a stipend but it was it was quite an honor to me uh you know at the beginning i felt like i was sort of an invisible person and she invited me to give a series of a tech sort of a, a tech talk tech talk uh format um presentation 
And, you know, I just, uh, I just put together a 15 min minute uh, presentation and, and she was, uh, she really liked it. And I think, um, I think one of the things that is really attractive about my research is the capability of designing basic basic science studies that are clinically meaningful and that have a potential of um, being rapidly translated and change uh, clinical practice as we know it. And, you know, it, it was really an honor for me to receive that award from the hands of, of our dean. And for those that are potentially interested in looking a little bit more on what that took, you can go to the wakehealth.edu uh, uh, website and uh, you'll find it under the Dean's Research Symposia series where she has her uh, lecture that led her to have the reward for the, from the Dean. Wow, Dr. Melendez, uh, it's been fantastic. So now your life has quite drastically changed. Now you're a mother. You have been married to Diego now more, for more than a decade. What? Um, let's see. 2006, we got married. <laughs> 12 years. I lost count. Uh, 13 years. 13 years. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so it, it's, been, it's been an amazing path. Uh, I know that we stay in touch in one way or the other, either through Facebook, the internet, or through my wife. I think the girls talk more to the girls. But uh, you know what you have done for your, yourself is quite amazing. And I know your husband has put a lot of personal effort and sacrifice also to yes. make you succeed. And you have done the same thing for him. And, you know, guys, uh, this was not a couples match, but eventually kind of turned into something similar to that because it was about balancing the life of the success of one person that wanted to be a surgeon and one person that wanted to be a physician investigator. And, and obviously she had to determine what she wanted to, to do for the rest of her life. And early on, instead of going through the match, and go, actually going through the match, she chose to eventually just dedicate her life to do research in, in, in I would say, cardiology, right? Because that's what you do. A hundred percent based on cardiology. Well, is there any other tips of advice from your personal life on how to make it in America for those uh, uh, people that feel at, at a loss they don't know what's going to happen with their future right now. Some of them are giving me calls about feeling depressed, about not having had much. They don't know what they yeah. should be doing for the next year or so, or sometimes they are just giving up on pursuing the certification in the SFMG. I know that that's not the case for you because you're EC, ECFMG certified, but for those that don't get there. So, um, listen, um, not being ECFMG certified is not the end of the world. There are so many needs uh, in many other areas of medicine where you can be extremely useful. And, and I have to, to say that I, uh, even though I, I've always been clinically oriented or, or from the early beginnings, um, you know, and then becoming a basic scientist, and then I'm I'm back for full circle because now I'm also in a cutting edge um, subspecialty where you know w you know it's 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 new and and it's not infrequent that I'm being called to get advice in how to. Um, take an approach in a, in a complex cardio-oncology patient. So um, it doesn't, you don't have to be in a clinical path to feel fulfill, fulfillment in what you do. Um, I think, honestly, the only way to do a great work is to love what you do. Um, I think also that in order to be successful, I think um, your desire to succeed has to be greater than your fears. Sometimes we get dominated by fears and um, the fear of failure is uh, perhaps one of the first things um, that I had to overcome. Um, and once you have the courage to 
overcome that that fear of failure, um, many, many, many doors will open. Um, that is one of my uh, tips. The other thing. Um, oh, that was beautiful. And and the other thing that I would say is that many people seems to come to this country waiting for the big break, you know? Uh, and, and you may, you may think that perhaps Joe Janicki gave me a big break and I feel like he did, you know, we all, we all have that person. We all, all have that person, but that oppor those opportunities, you really have to take advantage of them. And, and those big breaks, some, sometimes they come, um, this guy's, as hard work and if you yes. don't recognize that you are going to lose that opportunity so there's no free lunch in this country you have to be you have to work work hard there's no good substitute for hard work and and to me that is key do your best and be passionate about it and, and if you're not passionate about the path that you you're on look again See what is what is it that puts a fire in your belly, and I can assure you, you will succeed at that. Dr. Melendez, and before I say goodbye, what it's been like balancing life as a physician, a physician researcher, and being a mother? It's a um, it's interesting. <laughs> it is a constant juggling act. Um, listen, sometimes I feel like I'm killing it as a mother and I'm killing it as an investigator, but as I'm falling asleep, I'm forgetting the pediatrician appointment that I had for my daughter yesterday, or one day I'll be taking my daughter to the vet and my cat to the, you know, to the pediatrician type of thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, it's, it's a juggling act. Um, and remember, uh, I, and this is something that I, I think I learned from my mother, um, is that you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be courageous, you know, in these things. And, you know, people, people are forgiven, but the first, the first person that has to be for, forgiven is you towards yourself. Um, and, you know, I think, I think I learned many things and I, 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 I learned many things uh, being the daughter of a two very busy physicians. And um, one of them is, um, you know, I learned that gender was never a limit, you know, I, I I never, you know, here, I never grew up with the notion that I couldn't do anything uh, for, because I was a woman. Um, and it's really not. I am also lucky to be in an institution that it's um, very diverse, um, that it's uh, uh, very supportive of, of women. Um, and, um, listen, that, that's never, it's being a woman is not a limit. Um, and I think, um, my child will be a better person because of the way that I am passionate and, and her father is also very passionate about his work. And, at the end of the day, um, she, I hope uh, that she will get inspired by what we do and that sometimes, you know, it's true. Sometimes we cannot be there for her all the time, but that will also give her a sense of independence. And, and that was the uh, experience for me growing up as a very busy uh, physician in Latin America. And yeah, I, I, I think um, also the other thing that I learned uh, growing up um, was that status really doesn't define a person. I, I really met very, you know, powerful people in my home country, you know, deans of the medical school and very important physicians. And I really didn't care what they were. I just wanted I, I, all I care about is that they were kind to me. And that is something that I want to pass on. Um, not because you are enough, you know, you're a, at the top of the hill at the moment. 
keep being kind to other people because that's what's going to have an impact on that person and on the career development of that person. And especially, you know, me that I deal with medical students. Dr. Giselle Melender, it's been an hour plus of time here with you. And I'm going to tell you, despite the fact that I felt that I knew you very well, I, I don't think I had a, a skim of the depth of your life and your personality. Uh, with the very few uh, statements that you have said during the last five minutes, they're so moving and they're so, so deep that uh, I think uh, I know, I know a, a, a different Giselle of what I have <laughs> gotten to know this far because uh, this, this platform is trying to bring that out of people and, and, and I think to motivate those that don't know or they feel at a loss and, and you have accomplished the goal of making them feel better and probably reassured, reassured and probably try to find a way to make it in the U.S. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And needless to say, if anybody wants to reach out to me and, and have a conversation about how can they shape uh, their path, if they're interested in science, I'll be more than delighted. So we're we're gonna we're gonna leave the link for her email address at the bottom of the uh, description of the show. Well, Dr. Giselle Melendez, thank you very much for being here and taking an hour and a half of your time to share your personal life experience. And I know that you said that you were in the middle of your career, but uh, I wish I was half the way uh, through what you have accomplished thus far. And um, I, uh, God bless you. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Please keep listening, sharing, and caring because uh, we're going to keep producing some phenomenal content, and the content comes from your uh, uh, inquiries. So we brought Dr. Melendez due to the fact that many people wanted to know more about what it's like to be a physician researcher, a researcher in the United States or anywhere else in the world. So thank you for listening, and we'll stay in touch. Keep being my rock stars. God bless you all. Thank you, Alonso.